it's big. It's yes. a big, big church. Yes. Future church, yes. So how many people are Catholic? They are all Catholic in the area? No. 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 How yes. many people About come membership from? Membership now, uh, you're Catholic. No, Six or seven hundred. Do you think, considering uh, the number of mm. parishioners, was it absolutely uh, necessary to build such a big uh, church? It's in you foresight. Would have, uh, I think it's in foresight yes. of the movement. The movement. The, uh, anticipating the movement. Et je dois dire que une telle réalité nous renvoie à And I must say that we see similarities to the cathedral builders of the Middle Ages. They thought alike. They did not build chapels for themselves and the peasantry around them. They were convinced that their faith enabled them to build for future generations. When they would no longer be amongst the living. Nigeria is Africa's most densely populated country. 130 million people inhabit this land. Catholics make up 20% of the population, are well educated and presently exert a disproportionate influence on the whole country. The duty of the church is to reach out to all those in need of help, the poor and those abandoned by society. And of these, there is no shortage in Nigeria. The duty of the church is in many places to stand in for an inert state apparatus. Finally, the church's duty is to evangelize this vast country, without roads, largely based on tribal structures, inhabited by millions who have never heard Jesus' name. It's like two worlds here. Here in Jos, it's a little better. Out in the bush, it is more difficult. I try to spend the weekends in the villages, where there is no light, no water, nothing. But I want to identify with the people. I want to show them that they are our people, even if they are neglected by government, the church stands for them. The church is their hope. We don't have a church, let's say a church building as such, but we have a kind of a tent, a kind of shade, and maybe two, three families, that is the church. Maybe after one or two years, we will think of building a mall church with grass roof. Yet the biggest challenge that the church faces is not the lack of any infrastructure, but the constantly rising influence of Islam, an Islam radically opposed to Catholicism. Muslims are the dominant power in the north and determine the law. There are regions where the Sharia has been introduced, which totally precludes the public practice of any other religion, whilst in the still Catholic south, Islam's influence continues to grow. For the church, that is the fundamental pastoral and evangelical challenge. If we admit that Muslims have a right to spread their faith, we will not see Islamization as a crime, for example, or as a horrible thing. What we would rather see is that the effort of Muslims to convert Nigerians should challenge us, to intensify our own programs of Christianization, which we call evangelization. So I try to tell my priests to reach out to the communities that are not even Christians, Muslim communities, and I tell my seminarians, have a broad mind, be ready to embrace people. It is difficult, it's dangerous, but it is what our faith teaches us. So we must imitate our Holy Father, the Pope, by reaching out, by talking, even at the expense of our life sometimes, and even at great sacrifices. Our people really need, and need a lot of help. Most of them they are traditional worshippers, and I got interested in trying to see what I can do to improve their life. So that is how I just feel that if there's any way I could serve them, that is even why I decided to become a diocesan priest instead of a missionary priest. Twenty years ago, my father died, actually, and a priest took me and trained me up to my secondary school level. I discovered myself being helped by God in a different way. That motivated me more to come into the seminary. Nigeria's situation in terms of callings is quite unique. It undoubtedly has the largest number of priests and the largest number of seminarists in any African country. 
I will name the biggest seminary in the south in Baden. It numbers 750 seminarists. The situation is, of course, different in the north, but not because there are fewer callings. We were taken aback when we saw that the big seminary in Makordi had as many as 400 seminarists. That in Jos there are probably 250 and 200 in Kadum, in the big, completely new seminary under construction. It is, in effect, a hatchery of callings, albeit smaller. But above all else, it is the material difference between northern and southern seminaries that is most striking, like night and day. Somehow we see that God is doing something special here. The kind of vocations we are getting here it cannot be explained by any natural way. Sometimes we hear people, especially abroad, saying, oh, they are all going to the seminary because uh, they are poor, because uh, the priesthood is a way of raising their social standard. Uh, that those who say so have not come here to see exactly what is happening. To my aid, God. Lord, make us us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit works in the Nigerian church is clearly visible and exceptionally strong. One can judge that God has a unique plan for Nigeria. However, he needs help in its realization. The year go by and the vocations increase. This is my third year here, so there has been an average increase of about 30 students every year. So for this academic year, we have a number of 231 seminarians in residence. Over there, we have the student hostel. And for the moment, uh, that student hostel, we have about um, 65 students living in that uh, hostel. And they are living two, three in a room. And if we need to have new intake by October this year, uh, we need a new hostel. When we get up to 35 to 40, then that building will, be not, will not be enough for, for the seminary. And so we hope uh, to get a new hostel here. How? We don't know. But the sad aspect is that we receive so many applications. Like in this diocese, I had over 30 applications from students who are eager to become priests because there is need for priests. But then you are constrained to select maybe seven or ten at most in order to admit them. This is not because we have enough priests, but this is because we are limited by material means. <laughs> You don't want to say, yeah, go away, we are too many, because you can never say you have too many priests. We need them all the time, but at the same time, how do you adequately handle huge numbers in formation? There is a minimum of material conditions that have to be met if normal study is to be possible. An appropriate room, some air, as it can get very hot, also, a regularly updated library, one that would also make us duty-bound to make an annual contribution to enrich the collection. Yet this minimum is for many seminaries unattainable, especially those from northern Nigeria. Holy orders are taken after nine years of study, during which time the clerics are totally dependent for their upkeep on the local church. Bishops do what they can to support their seminaries. However, their dioceses are too poor to cope. On the other hand, it is not tenable to allow seminarists to be trained for a shorter time and to lower standards. We have the five main focuses, really. Intellectual formation, spiritual formation, human development formation, uh, pastoral and missionary formation, and so it is not all theory when we talk about missionary and pastoral formation. We are saying, in effect, that while during formation you are getting the theory, you also need to go out to practice as it were. So we have to send them while in school 